Good evening. I'm Gavin Cleesby, the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm happy to welcome you to our program. This evening, we'll hear from Tegan Kehoe, who will speak on her new book, Exploring American Healthcare Through 50 Historic Treasures. This book uh, presents a history of health and medicine in the United States, tracing paradigm shifts such as the introduction of anesthesia, the adoption of germ theory, and advances in public health. The book showcases little known objects that illustrate our complex relationship with health and highlights objects related to famous moments in medicine, ranging from vitamin D beer to the discovery of penicillin. Each artifact illuminates some piece of the social, cultural, and technical influences on how people approach fundamental questions about health. The program will look at a selection of these artifacts with an emphasis on Massachusetts stories. Ms. Kehoe is a public historian, museum curator, and writer. She specializes in the history of healthcare and science and society with social history with a social history angle. Her main research interests include material culture and the history of medicine, interpretation studies for history of medicine and the body. Uh, she works as the exhibition and education specialist at Paul S. Russell Museum of Medical History and Innovation at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Uh, before we get started, I just want to offer a special welcome to anyone who may be joining us for the first time. If you're unfamiliar with, MG with Mass Historical Society, we are an independent nonprofit organization that maintains a vast research library and hosts a wide variety of programs on topics related to Massachusetts and American history. We're only able to produce these programs because of the support of our members. So we hope that if you are uh, enjoying our programs but are not yet a supporter of MHS, you will either join MHS or, or make a donation to support our work. So without further ado, I'm happy uh, to invite uh, Tegan to come on and we can um, start the presentation. Thank you, Gavin. Um, and thank you to Mass Historical Society for having me and for all of you for being here this evening. Um, my book, Exploring American Healthcare Through 50 Historic Treasures, is in many ways a sampler of healthcare history, as well as a sampler of artifacts at museums and historic sites around the country. Today, I'll be sharing a small sample of the stories from my book. And while the Mass Historical Society is not featured in my book, I will be mentioning several points of connection with the Society's collections because there are plenty to choose from and, and it's, it's quite interesting. When I started writing my book, I remarked on how the inherent viscerality of medical history makes it tangible and something we can connect with, even when discussing discoveries from centuries ago. By the time I finished the book, we were in a pandemic and I didn't need to worry about whether people could connect with the subject. I do think that looking at the past can be a source of a lot of hope, but the hopeful stories aren't always clear cut. It's often that seeing the ways people from the past have struggled with ups and downs can better help us better understand what's going on in the present. In that light, the first couple of stories from my book that I'd like to share are about vaccines. The first disease to have a vaccine was smallpox, and much later, it also became the first disease to be fully eradicated. Smallpox was recognizable by the, the foul smelling pustules that covered a person's body, but it killed by causing internal bleeding and damaging the heart, lungs, and liver. In different outbreaks, the disease killed from 10 to 50% of its victims. The earliest known prevention practices began in the 12th century. People in Asia, Africa, and the Mediterranean protected themselves by deliberately catching a mild case of the disease that left them immune. They inhaled powdered material from smallpox patient scabs or inoculated themselves by inserting the scab material under their skin. Smallpox invaded this continent with the first Europeans and it con contributed to severe depopulation of native peoples. Inoculation against smallpox has been known in Boston since the 17 teens when an African man whom the Reverend Cotton Mather was holding in slavery explained it to Mather. The enslaved man's real name and birthplace aren't recorded but Mather called him Onesimus, and that's how we know him today. The spread of inoculation in the West is often attributed to Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who learned of the practice while traveling with her husband in Turkey. When she arrived home in England, she told her doctor about it, and it became a common practice, but by no means a universal one. Inoculating people with smallpox itself is called variolation, after the name of the smallpox virus, variola. It's not safe by modern standards. Patients did get a case of smallpox, but it was usually milder than if they had caught the wired, 
the wild virus, and the death rate was lower. Patients had to be quarantined while they recovered, or they risked passing the virus on. And if you caught the virus from someone who had been inoculated, you weren't guaranteed that milder case. It was actually never guaranteed, but it wasn't likely that you would get that milder case. It was just like you got it from anyone else. So debates raged over whether, whether this practice was safe and whether it was natural. This trade-off was hotly debated during the epidemic that swept North America during the Revolutionary War. Individuals and families weighed their options and military strategists discussed the risks of inoc inoculating the troops. Patients had to recover for about two weeks after inoculation and they were contagious during that time. So mass inoculation meant leaving ar armies vulnerable to enemy attack. In 1796, English doctor Edward Jenner began a new era when he inoculated eight-year-old James Phipps, not with smallpox, but with a milder related disease called cowpox. After a few months, he inoculated the boy with smallpox to try to produce a mild case, but he didn't get sick. He tried again several times, but Phipps never developed smallpox. Jenner began testing more people and writing up his results. He called his process vaccination after the cowpox virus, vaccinia. Dr. Benjamin Waterhouse, a founding faculty member of Harvard Medical School, read Jenner's report. Intrigued, he wrote to Jenner and asked for cowpox material to do his own experiments with. One of Waterhouse's first study subjects was his own five-year-old son. Experiments related to vaccination were often done on children because they hadn't had smallpox yet. So while to modern ears that can be a little alarming, they were the population that it made the most sense to do these experiments on. Three more of his children and two household servants followed. Waterhouse became the first proponent of vaccination in the United States. The artifact related to smallpox that I feature in my book and that we have up on the screen is in the collection of the Countway Library of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Because it was not endemic in the United States, Waterhouse regularly purchased cowpox material from England, typically shipped in poultry feather quills. In a shipment in 1802, Jenner packed the quills inside a gift for Waterhouse, this small, finely made silver stuffed snuff box with a gold inlay. And if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. The Massachusetts Historical Society has countless primary sources related to smallpox, and many of them have been digitized and are available online. They include newspaper clippings and broadsides, as well as numerous letters between individuals, referencing losing loved ones to smallpox, the decision to get inoculated when the only option was the pre-vaccine variolation, the epidemic during the siege of Boston in 1775 to 1776, and hopes and fears about the cowpox-based vaccine. I'd like to read a short excerpt from a lesser known document, which is what's on the screen. This is a broadside or flyer from around 1810 in Providence, Rhode Island, describing what to expect from a vaccine in rhyming couplets. The diet needs no deviation from that before inoculation. The little silken paper patch may soon be from the arm detached. Loose sleeves are best and arms kept cool. Children need not be kept from school, and so on. Um, thank you. You can take the slides down for the time being. After vaccination caught on, in 1855, Massachusetts became the first state in the U.S. to require school children to be vaccinated. Through the 19th century, vaccination in adults was often carried out in response to a current or a potential outbreak. Smallpox continued to spread over the continent through trade, where warfare, and migration. Representatives of the US government offered vaccination to a number of native groups, but withheld it from native groups who didn't cooperate with forced removal from their land. Rates of vaccination and of the disease varied by race and socioeconomic status. In the Civil War, for example, case rates of smallpox were more than six times higher among black soldiers than among white soldiers. Meanwhile, changing methods of preparing and administering vaccines were starting to ma make vaccines safer, but there was really no regulatory in insight or excuse me, oversight into vaccination until several, several decades into the 20th century. 
From 1898 to 1903, a wave of smallpox epidemics spread across the continent. It was the worst outbreak in at least a generation. In 1905, a US Supreme Court case that originated in Cambridge, Mass, set the legal precedent for how far reaching vaccine mandates could be. Henning Jacobson, a local pastor, remembered having had a bad reaction to the vaccine when he was a child in Sweden and refused to be vaccinated again. He did need it again, since the vaccine available at the time conferred immunity for about seven years. Since Jacobson didn't comply with Cambridge's vaccine order, he was charged a $5 fine. The Supreme Court concluded that the mandate was constitutional and that the government could limit personal choice for the sake of public health if the mandates met certain standards, including being necessary for public health, being proportional to the risks of the situation, and minimizing harm to the individual. Of course, this was not the end of debates over vaccines. In the middle of the 20th century, there was a swell of support for vaccines. Because of a period of trust in science, the importance of vaccines in ending the polio epidemics, and a range of new vaccines that protected against common but deadly childhood illnesses. In the past 40 years or so, despite more regulations and more safety testing than ever, there has been a vocal minority against a number of common vaccines, as many of you well know. Rather than going into depth on the modern anti-vaccination movement though, I'd like to zoom out and discuss what different attitudes towards health interventions mean in their historical context. I'm going to read an excerpt from the introduction to my book. A popular impression is that medical history is a tidy story about progress and the march of science, in which one discovery builds on another while incorrect ideas get discarded and forgotten. In some other tellings, science veered off of the path of what humans need and now progresses further away. At the same time, the popular imagination paints medical history as a gruesome spectacle, filled with the macabre and not for the faint of heart. The artifacts in this book show that both the inevitable march forward and the macabre templates are partially true and both have flaws. Behind the ghastly reality of surgeons operating without cleaning their bone saws between patients, there were people doing their best with what they knew. The same is true for patients buying nostrums, and the same is true for doctors and public health officials debating the safety of raw milk in the 1880s or of DDT in the 1960s. Rather than solely looking at advances in healthcare, it's useful to examine trends in how people have answered some fundamental questions with what they knew. Each artifact tells some piece of the story of how its users approached or answered one or more of these questions. Perhaps the most basic of these questions is this, what causes sickness and what causes health? Mainstream scientific understanding has not only changed over time, but has gone through periods of expansion and contraction, supporting either one underlying cause of disease, such as unbalanced tumors or invading microorganisms, or diverse causes, including vitamin deficiency and pollutants. Meanwhile, cultural and religious practices home remedies, and sales pitches provided alternative theories, many of which appeared to their adherents to counterbalance the flaws of mainstream science. A related question is this, how do we solve health problems that have been identified when knowing what causes them isn't enough? Often it becomes an engineering problem, literally in the sense of creating new technologies or figuratively in creating new surgical techniques to address a known issue. The field of healthcare has developed clearer, more helpful, and more accurate answers to these questions over time, and yet there's still much to learn. Broadening the scope from how to treat diseases to how to treat patients, another fundamental question is how care should be organized within care facilities and within professions. Something as simple as a nurse's uniform is actually part of the complex evolution of the role of the nurse, from an informal, untrained caregiver to a member of an emerging trade with clothing re resembling that of a maid to a trained professional. Organizing care involves challenges when money, physical space, and practitioners' time are all finite. These questions become urgent when conditions like war or epidemics create the need for decisions that affect who lives or dies. Another core question is this, to what extent can everyone know and master the principles of health 
And to what extent do people need to rely on outside authorities? Relatedly, how can a patient determine whether a provider truly wants to help or only wants to exert control or make money? The decades of the late 19th and early 20th centuries are well represented in this book because of a large number of developments in scientific medicine. The germ theory revolution, x-rays, antibiotics, and other developments greatly increased many people's willingness to trust science. However, both alternative health trends and unscrupulous practitioners persisted, creating the need for a trend towards greater accountability in the 20th century, including FDA regulations and the requirement that research abide by institutional review boards. When not everyone agrees on who has authority in health, how much should doctors and governments provide for the health of the populace? When there's a risk benefit judgment to be made, who makes it? People often care about factors that science ignores, such as whether a treatment is affordable, whether it's in line with their understanding of the world and their attitude towards outside authority and systems of power. This is clear in the diverse public attitudes towards masks and vaccines in the coronavirus pandemic, which is an evolving story as this book is being written. These questions may be cerebral, but healthcare is inherently visceral. Think of the cool feel of nitrile gloves, the goopy strep throat medicine you took as a child, or the closeness of a mask. At any given moment in the past, the physicality of healthcare might be the soft worn edges of the toys the visiting nurse brought with her, the grasp of the metal calipers measuring your head, or the tarry stink of tar carbolic acid, a precursor to today's much gentler antiseptic hospital smell. The physical stuff of healthcare makes abstract concepts like trust, prejudice, and persuasion tangible. Historian and museum curator Daniel Neff has remarked on a powerful phenomenon he observed when giving tours on both weapons of the American Revolution and medicine of the American Revolution at the same museum. Visitors were excited by visceral, gory content on the weapons tour. A bayonet makes a triangular wound that heals poorly but fearful or disgusted by similar content on the medical history tour. It soon became clear that visitors imagined themselves inflicting the damage when taking the weapons tour, but imagined themselves as the victim or patient when taking the medicine tour. The history of healthcare can inspire deep empathy. I invite you to look for opportunities for empathy with the patients, caretakers, researchers, and victims and survivors of the complex stories that these historic treasures tell. The remainder of the stories from my book that I'd like to share with you this evening go in roughly chronological order, but several of them, like the smallpox story, take place over long periods of time. For example, alternative medicine movements, many of which might sound to modern ears like they were invented by 1960s flower children, first blossomed around the 1830s. At the same time, mass-produced name brand drugs began to proliferate across the country. Both of these trends were partly in reaction to what was often called regular medicine. Today, regular medicine is called mainstream, biomedical, or scientific medicine, but it wasn't very scientific in the early 19th century. While individual doctors did experiments with varying levels of scientific rigor, it would be nearly a century before randomized controlled trials were standard. And applying what we'd consider epidemiological analysis to disease outbreaks was a pretty new idea. Doctors relied on wisdom that had been handed down through medical schools. The theory of the four humors, which comes to us from the ancient Greeks and has similarities to ancient Indian and Arab medical traditions, still influenced physicians in the 19th century. Humoral theory stated that the body and temperament are governed by four forces that can cause harm when out of balance. Bleeding and purging were often used to try to rectify that balance. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, some leading doctors essentially streamlined humoral theory to focus on large doses of treatments that produced dramatic effect. This was sometimes called heroic medicine. Doctors raised blisters, used bloodletting, and gave laxatives and emetics. And heroic didn't always mean helpful. The popular drug calomel or blue mass, often given for a host of different complaints, could cause mercury poisoning, for example. The various schools of thought that we might call alternative or complementary medicine today were often lumped under the name irregular medicine in the 19th century. Often present, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> 
often pre stressing preventive care, irregular doctors position themselves in opposition to the authoritative medical establishment and harsh treatments like blue mass. They appealed to people who wanted to be self-reliant or wanted medicine to seem gentle and natural. A number of irregular medical philosophies preached that the health of the body and the spirit could be attained by abstaining from alcohol, eating a specific diet, for example, vegetarian, or following similar rules. Other 19th century irregular trends included naturopathy, the power of positive thinking, chiropractic, and mesmerism. The founders and most enthusiastic of adherents of these trends considered them holistic approaches to health. If you had this, you didn't need anything else, was their thinking. Could I have the screen share back in the next slide, please? The other alternative to going to the doctor for bleeding and mercury was to treat yourself with patent medicines. This term referred to almost any tonic, pill, or powder with a proprietary formula and a name brand. The example on the screen and in my book is a bottle of Hostetter's Celebrated Stomach Bitters. And yes, celebrated is part of the name. Advertisements claimed that Hostetter's cured and prevented nearly infinite ills, from gastrointestinal distress to nervous prostration, mental gloom, and general lack of vigor. This was a hallmark of patent medicine ads. Most of these medicines did nothing except make the consumer feel good briefly with alcohol, morphine, other things like that. Hostetter's was mostly alcohol and was even sometimes sold by the glass in saloons. Many patent medicine makers claimed they could cure anything and replace doctors. But people also used patent medicines in addition to regular medicine, the way one might buy over-the-counter cough syrup today. There were no laws limiting some drugs to prescription only until the 20th century, so all of the options were over-the-counter at the time. The specific bottle of Hostetters in my book is in the Museum of the Rockies in Montana. When the car while the company started in Pittsburgh, Hostetters was often marketed to travelers and people moving to territory unknown to them during the US conquest of the people and land to the West. Advertisements highlighted the likelihood of gastrointestinal distress on these journeys. At the time, both regular medicine and popular understanding believed that putrid air could cause disease. Traveling would make it hard to see a doctor if indeed a doctor could be helpful. Woe to him who encounters the malaria of a tropical seaboard or the miasma of a Western swamp with his stomach untoned and nerves unbraced. This warning was in an essay in the 1868 edition of Hostetter's Almanac, which the company published annually from 1861 to 1909. The proposed solution, naturally, was Hostetter's bitters as a daily preventative. Next slide, please. Thank you. A patent medicine I mention only briefly in the book, but I want to discuss here because of a local connection, is Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound. Pinkham's was unusual, in part because the advertising featured a real woman, the company's founder. It was also intended to be specifically for women's health. In this era, women were seen as the guardians of their family's health, particularly their children's, but their own health was often an afterthought. For much of the 19th century, women were very literally considered the weaker sex, and many women's health issues were dismissed as being inevitable parts of the condition of womanhood. We see echoes of this today, even though the science behind these ideas has been discredited. Lydia Pinkham's vegetable compound was marketed for female complaints. The list of ailments it purported to cure include difficult or painful menstruation, menopausal issues, and uterine tumors but also depression, sleeplessness, general debility, and again, nervous prostration. In a sense, it played into popular understandings of women's health, but the company didn't assume that female complaints were women's cross to bear. Instead, it offered the option of treating them. Even better, it promised treatment without an invasive gynecological exam by a male doctor at a time when women physicians were few and far between. And, their idea of professionalism, um, doctors at the time idea of professionalism, was very paternalistic, so a, a different bedside manner than one would hope for today. Patent medicines let women take their health into their own hands. The company lore was that Lydia Pinkham, who was born in Lynn, Massachusetts in 1819, made her herbal tonics in her kitchen. At first, she only sold them because other women asked her to. 
but after the panic of 1873 put her family in hard financial straits, she reluctantly went commercial. Whether or not her original aspirations were so modest, her patent medicine became wildly popular. Versions are actually still sold today. This isn't necessarily to say that it works. It's classified as an herbal supplement, so the makers aren't required to demonstrate its efficacy, but it clearly had an impact on the market. Mass Historical has a few biographies of Pinkham from the first half of the 20th century, and they remember her as an early woman entrepreneur. While medicine didn't see a great number of advances in the 19th century until the last few decades, the field of surgery did make a number of great strides in the mid 19th century. Many of these were due to new techniques, new instruments, or increasing specialization by surgeons. But in the 1840s, several practitioners hit upon an answer to the problem of pain, as it was often called. This story is in many ways one of an engineering problem, but there's also a component of the story in which the practitioners themselves disagreed about whose authority could really be trusted. On an autumn day in 1846, a group of doctors gathered in the surgical amphitheater at Massachusetts General Hospital to see an operation in progress. Watching an operation they weren't involved in wasn't remarkable. The room was designed with seating for about 100, just as in many of the operating theaters in Europe and a few major other hospitals in the United States. However, in this case, the hospital's co-founder and eminent surgeon, John Collins Warren, had allowed a dentist uh, to offer a public demonstration of a drug that promised to conquer pain. The patient was a young man named Gilbert Abbott who had a painful growth on his neck. As you might imagine, before anesthesia, the operation to address such a sensitive area was typically very painful. Some doctors gave patients opium or alcohol to try to dull the pain. Next slide, please. The dentist, William Morton, was actually rather late to the operation. He brought with him a hollow glass globe, very much like the one pictured. He had this inhaler custom made, and it's said that he was late because he was having last minute adjustments made to it. Inside the globe was a natural sponge soaked with, soaked with a chemical. Morton called it lithion and said it was a chemical of his own creation, but it was really diethyl ether, a synthetic solvent with known applications in science, plus some orange oil to mask ether's distinctive sickly sweet scent. Morton was determined to get a patent for anesthesia, which is why he was making last minute adjustments to the inhaler and saying this chemical was his own creation. He later did get a patent, but it was re rendered unenforceable very quickly. In later uses of ethers, people sometimes administered it on a prosaic, unpatentable piece of cloth rather than a complicated inhaler. Once he was in place, Morton held the inhaler up to the patient's nose and mouth and had him breathe in the sweet vapors for several minutes. The patient fell unconscious and the doctors looked on in nervous anticipation. It was clearly having an effect, but they weren't sure it would really conquer pain. One reason for doubt was that Morton was an outsider. Doctors at the time did not see dentists as fellow medical professionals at all. But also a year earlier, dentist Horace Wells used nitrous oxide to anesthetize a patient in front of a room full of Harvard Medical School students. Also called laughing gas, the gas was already known for causing a high. It's used as a mild anesthetic to this day, but in this demonstration, the patient groaned and appeared to be in considerable pain. The students jeered and called Wells' demonstration a humbug. The operation to address the tumor on Abbott's neck went according to plan, no complications. But then of course the question was, will the patient wake up? The doctors looking on worried that he would be in a coma, that he would die, or that he wouldn't recover all of his senses. But he did wake up and he said he remembered a scraping sensation, but no pain. Dr. Warren turned to the crowd and pronounced, gentlemen, this is no humbug. Within the next few weeks and certainly the next few months, word spread in newspapers and medical journals throughout the country and throughout the world. A year later, Dr. James Simpson of Edinburgh tested a number of chemicals with similar chemical properties to ether and discovered that chloroform could be used as an anesthetic as well. William Morton believed that the discovery of anesthesia was his and his alone, but not everyone agreed. Horace Wells felt that he had an earlier claim. In Athens, Georgia, surgeon Crawford Long had used ether to induce anesthesia in 1842, 
but he didn't publicize his results until 1849, once Morton's demonstration had become famous. In addition, physician Charles Thomas Jackson announced that he had discovered ether anesthesia first. Morton had nominally been studying medicine under him, although the arrangement was a loose one. Jackson made a reasonably well-supported claim that he had suggested to Morton that ether might work as an anesthetic, and a hotly contested claim that he should get the credit above Morton for its discovery. Next slide, please. Thank you. Mass General has quite a bit of information on the famous demonstration, as well as the reception of anesthesia in the years following in our archives. People researching the history of this story in depth also often consult the Mass Historical Society because they hold the papers of Dr. John Collins Warren, the papers of a descendant of Gilbert Abbott who did some research on him, and the medal that William Morton received from the National Institute of France in 1850 for the discovery of anesthesia. Um, and that's what's on the screen. He was actually quite chagrined because he was given this prestigious Prix Montion jointly with Charles Jackson. Historical debates about who should get the credit for solving a problem in healthcare tell us something about what was most important to the people involved. But the debate over Ether's discovery didn't directly affect patients. They had access to anesthesia regardless of who invented it. Debates over how to organize care, on the other hand, almost always directly affect patients. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, state and federal governments looked at Hansen's disease, then known as leprosy, as a major challenge in organizing care. The question was not just how to quarantine people who had a disease that was believed to be extremely contagious, but how to do so for people who would then be there for life. For years, Hansen's disease was said to be spread by association with sin, being figuratively dirty, but had it been known to science since 1873, it was actually caused by a bacterium. This didn't change the stigma against the disease. And the fact that it was also believed to be associated with tropical countries was an avenue for racist attitudes to be mixed in with the rest of the stigma. One public health official in the late 19th century wrote, lepers shun people instinctively, but remain human for a long time. This cruel dehumanization is not uncommon in descriptions of people with deformities and disabilities, but it was particularly blatant in descriptions of people with Hansen's. Several states tried to found quarantine hospitals for patients with Hansen's disease, but they often met with ire from the communities that the hospitals would be in or near. In recent years, scientists have discovered that the disease is only transmissible with prolonged contact, and around 95% of humans are naturally immune because susceptibility is linked with a fairly rare gene. So Hansen's is actually quite hard to transmit. But at the turn of the last century, scientists, as well as the general public, still thought it was wildly contagious. Next slide, please. In 1904, the state of Massachusetts purchased Penakees Island, a 75-acre island in Buzzards Bay, to use as a quarantine hospital or leper colony in the parlance of the day. The state had already chosen two other sites on the mainland, but never built there because of opposition from local communities. In addition to being separated from their families and friends by water, Many of the patients were immigrants who didn't share a common language with one another or with their doctors, making this quarantine hospital an extremely isolating experience. Similarly, the state of Louisiana founded the leper home at Carville in 1894, following a state law calling for people with the disease to be quarantined. The law banned Hansen's disease patients from public transit. So the hospital's first residents arrived on a coal barge. Louisiana also had a hard time finding a location. They event eventually built the hospital on the outskirts of a small town called Carville, 20 miles south of Baton Rouge. In 1921, the federal government turned Carville into the National Leprosarium. Massachusetts closed the quarantine hospital on Penakees Island in response and sent its 13 patients to Carville. The only physical remains of that hospital are a few stone gate posts and the graves of patients who died there because the state burned and then dynamited the, the buildings once they were vacant. Um, the Carville Hospital, on the other hand, was active up until on, only about 20 years ago and almost all of the buildings still stand and it is a historic site that can be visited 
and it's one of the sites in my book. Over the course of the century that Carville was in operation, the question of how to best care for the residents was not just discussed by doctors and by bureaucrats. It became an area for both collaboration and fierce debate and sometimes power struggles between hospital leadership and the residents themselves. Especially in the early years, residents were often barred from seeing their families and generally treated like inmates. The institution sometimes punished leaving against medical advice, whether for a night away or as an attempt to leave permanently with a stay in the on-site jail. And against medical advice really meant anyone with the disease was not allowed to leave at the time. That changed over the course of uh, the years that the hospital was open. Next slide, please. Thank you. Many residents expected to be at Carville for life, and they did their best to create community, recreation, and independence for themselves with or without the institution's approval. Married couples, some of whom met at Carville, often built their own small cottages as they weren't initially allowed to live together in the dorm-like residences. This image shows new dorms under construction in the 1940s, and they did have housing for, for couples. It's an example of one of the changes over time. Over the decades, the site had movie theaters, chapels, sports teams, and an annual Mardi Gras celebration. There were two of almost everything, one for patients, one for staff. After antibiotics created effective treatments in the middle of the 20th century, some people recovered and were discharged. Nor numerous former Carville residents challenged the stigma of their disease with their writing and their speaking, describing their diverse experiences. Many of them began this work around the same time as the emerging disability rights movement in the 1960s and 1970s. Many residents did advocacy work from within Carville as well, especially through writing for the residents' newspaper, The Star. It was Carville residents in The Star who first advocated for changing the name from the medieval sounding leprosy to Hansen's disease after the scientist who had identified the bacterium. After decades of advocacy, people with Hansen's no longer expect their families to disown them after diagnosis. However, the history of this disease and phrases such as treat someone like a leper are a, rem a reminder of the fact that value judgments and even judgments about who's human have a powerful influence on health decisions in our society. Everyone has a reason for the healthcare choices that they make, whether that's for themselves and their families, or whether they're making healthcare policy, and whether or not the choices end up being good ones. The reasons aren't just about the science. They're influenced by politics, faith in various belief systems, trust and distrust of certain authorities, prejudice, affordability, comfort, and myriad other factors. This way of examining the stories in my book, focusing on the questions that people tried to answer and how they framed those questions, can lead itself to a fairly individualistic lens through which to view history, but it doesn't have to. Major historical events and movements ranging from the Civil War and World War II to the Industrial Revolution and the social reforms of the progressive era to attitudes about race and gender were all important driving forces for many of the decisions that people made around healthcare in the stories in my book. However, studying history through questions like how to organize care how to balance risks, and who gets to have a voice in their own or other's treatment helps us see what we have in common with people who are operating from very different historical and scientific contexts. Um, and with that, I'll close, and I'm happy to take questions or comments, whether about they're about uh, the stories that I shared tonight um, or anything else about the book. Great. Well, Thank you very much uh, for a very informative uh, talk. We do have some questions from the audience. Um, so just to have a person to ask the question, um, I would point out that Ron, Ron said hi, Keegan. He was looking forward to the talk. Uh, not you. exactly a question, but uh, worth mentioning. Um, he also followed up with an actual question where he said, uh, did Lydia uh, Pinkham's medicine actually have a desirable and useful effect uh, because it contained iron? That's a very good question. I don't know whether there are studies on that. Um, there are anecdotal reports. Um, I think the fact that it's still on the market suggests that there are definitely believers. Um, but I have not come across in my reading about Lydia Pinkham whether, um, whether it's been studied. And one of the things that 
scientists look for in determining whether something might work is whether there's a known mechanism. Not all mechanisms are known. We still don't fully understand how anesthesia works, although we're getting closer. But the fact that something contains iron and iron can be helpful for um, you know, certain uh, menstrual irregularities, that sort of thing, um, there's a possible mechanism. So it's plausible, but I haven't come across whether there's a yet known answer to that. Great question. Um, great. Tony asks, um, I was surprised to learn uh, that 19th century doctors consider dentists to be outsiders. When did the doctors recognize dentists as equals in healthcare? That may be not quite yet. <laughs> yes, it depends on who you ask. Um, that's a great question. Um, the, the exact year of this event is escaping me, but sometime in the first half of the 19th century, there was an event that um, dentists, or at least dentists with an interest in history, refer to as the historic rebuff, which was when a pair of dentists approached a prestigious medical school about founding a dental program there. And the medical school basically said, what are you doing? We're a medical school. We're, we're not going to uh, admit potential dentists. Um, and so that was the historic rebuff. And by some people's account, medicine and dentists, dentistry were on separate paths from there on out. However, a number of medical schools do have dental programs. A, a dental degree is a, a, doctor, a doctor of dental medicine degree. It is a medical degree. Um, so in terms of when that rift started to heal, um, it was really a gradual process. Um, I think that one of the things that was transformative, if not the only thing, um, is um, in World War I, there were a lot of advances in um, oral and maxillofacial surgery, especially reconstructive surgery for um, soldiers who had had uh, damage to their face in um, either from shrapnel or gunshots or various other things. Um, and so that um, oral surgeons becoming really important and respected surgeons was one of the things that um, helped people understand, helped people within other medical professions understand how important dentistry is. Um, the fact that dental insurance is often a separate add-on component to health insurance is often cited as one of the pieces of evidence that we still don't understand or really appreciate, even if we do understand how much dental health is linked to the rest of physical health. Actually, I have to say, it just reminds me of um, at one point when I had oral surgery, I was nervous because I didn't have dental care. And they were like, oh, but that's surgery. So that was covered. <laughs> and it was like, oh, but well, you won't pay to clean my teeth. Uh, but, um, well, Janet asks, uh, uh, did the way vaccines were administered change over the centuries? Uh, when did doctors start using needles? Great question. Um, I don't know off the top of my head um, when doctors started using needles, but the hypodermic needle that we know today is a fairly recent historical invention. Um, so, you know, by the mid 20th century, that would be the standard is administering a vaccine through a needle, unless you have something like the um, oral vaccine for polio, which was actually, you would put it in a little Dixie cup full of water or on a sugar cube and the patient would just drink it. Um, but if you're getting a shot, it would be through a hypodermic needle. Um, the method that was used in, um, in Dr. Waterhouse's day was essentially abrading the skin or um, making one or more cuts in the skin and then inserting the material um, onto and into the skin. The, the insertion was because you had already made the cut that that was possible. Um, and so that was, um, if, you, if you've seen in a medical history collection or maybe another museum, um, either a lancet, which is just uh, one knife sometimes folding, or a fleam, which is several different blades, often kind of lever activated from a little box. Um, it's kind of horrifying looking if you think about it. Um, and if you think about possibly opening it wrong and cutting yourself. Um, but uh, either of those would create that um, basically opportunity for the outside material to get in the skin um, 
even though you're not giving the person a shot as we know it today. Right. So there's actually uh, two people had questions about um, the Ether Monument in uh, the Boston comment. Uh, Susan said, can you uh, relay the story of how the Ether Monument in Boston's uh, public garden reflected the controversy over invented Ether? Uh, and Peter said, can you say something about the public monument to Ether, anesthesia in the public garden, a very large object? But I think there's uh, interest in both and, and some of the controversy around uh, the Ether Monument. Sure. Um, so that was erected I believe about 40 years after the initial demonstration. Well, I say initial demonstration, I'm referring to the one that happened at Mass General Hospital. That wasn't the only initial demonstration. Um, but uh, at that time, it was still really hotly debated. Um, and I think there's an argument that it, that debate continues to this day of which individual and which institution should really get the credit for anesthesia. Um, and some of those key players, um, Morton and Jackson and Wells in particular, really, they were part of that controversy. They were trying to get the credit for themselves. Um, as far as I know, Crawford Long was much less a part of that controversy. He wasn't local, which has a contributing factor. Um, but there were also people who, you know, took sides, essentially. And so it wasn't just these individuals who had this controversy. It was really, you know, who gets the credit? And there are some sort of philosophy of science questions inherent in that. It's not just about who was first, but which thing makes the discovery? Is it a successful demonstration? Is it a mostly successful demonstration of a successful technology, but the thing that actually, or the things that actually prove that it works come later? Um, is it hitting upon the idea? Because Jackson never claimed to have experimented with this before Morton did. He claimed that he thought of it before Morton did and told Morton about it. Um, so there is that kind of ideological component to the controversy. And so when this monument was erected in the Boston Public Garden, they ended up deciding to um, have the allegorical biblical story of the Good Samaritan as the prominent visual in the monument. So this is the idea of we're conquering pain. We're allowing doctors and people in the medical field to be more humane than they've ever had the technology to be. And that's the part that's going to be celebrated on the monument. However, the monument does reference Mass General Hospital. So I think that some Mass General folks feel like, you know, they won in that sense with this monument. Yeah, I, I know that the uh, medal that you showed um, from the MHS collection, um, only the core part of it was actually the medal presented, but mm -hmm. then uh, the rest was added on to make it more grandiose, <laughs> to further the claim of, of right. discovery. Um, and if, I, if I remember correctly from what I read, um, Morton received both the medal and prize money, and he used that prize money to have that decorative metal collar created for the medal to make it bigger. And if you uh, see it in person, it is like gigantic, like, <laughs> the largest metal that I've seen in a long time. <laughs> so it certainly conveys, uh, you know, importance. Um, so Kat said, um, have you noticed any regional differences in attitudes, approaches, or questions in the history of medicine? That's a great question. Um, and to be honest, it's not one that I've given a lot of thought to. I think that um, certainly at different times, there have been regional differences in um, and how people approach questions, how people approach these healthcare questions, um, because there have been different, different influences. Um, so in, uh, you know, early 19th century New England was, there were a lot of people who were really, really invested in being self-reliant. That was kind of the idea of what being a Yankee was. It was this self-reliance. And so when we talk about national trends like Jacksonian democracy and these ideas of, you know, every man for himself and their ideas about self-reliance did tend to privilege white middle-class able-bodied men. Um, they, were the, they were the person who were the people in this uh, society. Um, they, if you have that, regionally as well as nationally, then you're more likely to become interested in something like 
I don't need a fancy medical degree to start practicing medicine. I can found my own business and sell people herbal tonics and, um, you know, write poems to help them remember which tonic to use, which a couple of different companies in that era used as a, a strategy. Um, but none of these things are universal. None are. You don't have, you know, the, the South wasn't against self-reliance, um, but it wasn't necessarily part of a particular cultural ethos in a given decade. So I hope that example helps, even though it was a little nebulous as compared to sort of the breadth of the initial question. So we had a, an anonymous attendee or anonymous question um, who says, uh, does your book include barber poles and the tales of how barbers were frequently surgeons? Um, that's a good question. It references that, but doesn't go into depth. Um, so the tradition of bar barber surgeons um, is quite a bit older than the United States. And my book starts um, really with the United States as a political entity, just, just a little bit before. Um, so while there have been um, European settlers on this continent for much longer than that, um, and there have been people on this continent for much, much longer than that, um, that's sort of where I started this history. And so um, the, this idea of barber surgeons, um, which were, uh, let me back up for a little bit, before surgery was a trained part of, you know, branch of medicine, um, it was a trade. And it was not considered a high status trade, although it was very much an essential one. And the people who um, might, you know, cut a tumor off your neck rather than John Collins Warren, or the people who might pull your tooth, um, were also the same people who would shave you. Um, so these barber surgeons, uh, that, was, that was part of their trade. Um, this could be something self-taught, but in parts of Europe, it was also, there were guilds and it was treated like other trades. Um, and that tradition was waning, but not over at the time that my book starts. Um, so uh, I do have um, a bleeding cup in the book or a couple of bleeding cups, which uh, were for um, bloodletting. That's a, you know, kind of a holdover from that medieval era. Um, although those particular cups are from the Civil War. Um, but that's definitely a fascinating part of history that uh, doesn't get as much attention in my book as some of the other subjects. Um, so I think we just have time for about one one more question or so. Um, but do you have uh, an object in your book that really surprised you that you'd really like people to know about? Is there something that just sort of like really stands out as the thing that you, you didn't expect? That's a good question. And it's kind of like when people ask me my favorite artifact in the book or my favorite artifact in the museum where I work where I have answers, but they change frequently. Um, but I think um, one that I expect to surprise others. And so I often include it in descriptions of my book and blurbs and that sort of thing is vitamin D beer. Um, and that was uh, from the early 20th century uh, during the first vitamin craze. So anyone who's maybe eight years old or older has lived through at least one vitamin craze because they happen often where, you know, the cover of every health magazine and that sort of thing and every, you know, kombucha bottle in the store is saying this particular vitamin or sometimes these days it's micronutrient, which typically means vitamin or mineral, is the thing that will, will cure you or that will make you healthy, that will ensure vitality. Um, those crazes started basically as soon as we understood that vitamins exist. And that was early 20th century when that research really started to get going. Um, and so um, a couple of scientists in Wisconsin figured out both what vitamin D is, the fact that it was the um, connecting factor between things like rickets, which is a vitamin D deficiency and various other things in health, um, and UV light and um, certain fats and certain fats that had been exposed to UV light. Um, so they started putting all these pieces together. And because they were putting those pieces together, it became possible to fortify things with vitamin D. Um, Wisconsin has a big dairy industry. So one of the first things that got fortified was milk. But um, there was also a um, lager that was being sold as sunshine vitamin D beer. 
And the idea was that you were capturing the health rays of the sun in your bottle of beer. Um, and it didn't really catch on. And I have some theories about why that don't, I don't have enough evidence to fully support them, but I think that um, at the time, ideas about things like vitamins were even more heavily gendered than they have been in more recent years. And this idea of, you know, a woman taking care of her home was, was really important in how vitamins were often marketed. And so something that was closer to like an athleisure energy drink would be the today equivalent. You know, the advertisements were showing people uh, drinking beer on the, the deck of a sailboat. You know, it's that kind of um, athleticism and leisure and recreation all in one in your beer advertising. Um, that it was just, it was a little too soon for this idea is my personal theory. So that's vitamin D beer. Um, it surprised me at first and it's one that I expect to surprise others. Although maybe you've already heard of it and, and this is old, but, um, but it's a fun one. Um, well, thank you. There is one uh, final thing, which is uh, John asked, where can he get a signed copy of the book? <laughs> and we'll uh, let people know where to order a book from, but uh, a signed copy might be different. <laughs> yes, great question. Um, so the book is sold in many different places. You can get it right from the publisher, Roman and Littlefield. You can get it on Amazon. I have a bookshop.org site, um, which is just my name, Tegan Kehoe, um, or you can order it uh, from your local bookstore uh, through bookshop.org or just straight from your bookstore. Um, so currently, there are not a lot of signed copies out there in the world. And because of the pandemic, I've been sorting through how to make that possible. Um, but I do make it, I try to make it so that if you can spell my name, you can contact me. It's my Twitter handle, it's my website, it's my email, and so on. Um, and so if there's anyone who's interested in a signed book plate, I'm happy to pop one of those in the mail if you get in touch with me. Um, and signed copies might exist in the future, um, but they don't quite yet. Great. Well, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, and here is... Uh, among other things, the link to bookshop.org. Um, but I think this was a, a fascinating talk and a great program, and I hope everybody uh, enjoyed it. And I hope you all uh, order copies of the book so that they'll be available as soon as they're shipping. So uh, thank you, uh, Tegan, and uh, have a great evening to everyone. Thank you, Gavin, and thank you, everyone, for being here. <laughs>